You're listening to the Home Staging Show podcast. I'm your host, Cindy Lin. This is the show where we talk about all things real estate, home staging, and selling your home to live and to sell. Welcome back to season four. This is episode seven. Our show is brought to you by our in-house product, Eco Joe, the eco-friendly St. Joseph Statue Home Selling Kit. In real estate, there's a tradition of burying St. Joseph statues for good luck. But because all the existing products on the market were made with plastic, we made an eco-friendly version named Eco Joe. He's all natural, won't harm the earth. For more information, you can visit our website at www.ecojoekits.com. That's spelled E-C-O-J-O-E-K-I-T-S dot C-O-M. Hey guys, welcome back to episode seven of season four.、Uh, you might hear some background noises today. I'm actually recording at my art school.、Um, the internet at my Airbnb is not very strong, so it takes forever to upload the episode. So yeah, today, so I'm recording at the school just to use the internet here.、Um, on today's show, I'm interviewing home stager and interior designer Holly Bellamy. The reason I brought her on today is because I want to interview someone who specializes in doing occupied homes, as well as having a really strong design background that can give you all the information you need on how to pull rooms together when you're living in the home while selling the house. There's also some really useful information for those of you who are in the profession and who are building a home staging business. So imaginative, happy, and charming has always described Holly herself every bit as much as it describes her beautiful designs. Prior to following a creative path, however, Holly earned an education degree and teaching credential. She then taught at the elementary school level before having and staying at home with her own children. In 2006, Holly launched a home staging business. Clients soon clamor for her to design their new homes as well, leading to the birth of Holly, Holly, sorry, Holly Bellamy Interiors as a full-service interior design firm. Today, Holly transformed her clients' homes into spaces that support and uplift their spirits through organized, peaceful living. Her designs are further distinguished by their imagination and warmth. A design experience with Holly is like no other. Her clients seek beautiful, well-designed homes that also have heart. They find in Holly a designer whom they can trust to reflect their passion for family in their rooms. So I hope you'll get a lot、uh, from today's episode. We did chat a lot about design principles, especially the ones that are really important when it comes to home staging and interior design as well.、Um, Holly is also very thrifty. She's very hands-on, so she has a lot of great tips on how to use things that you have to create the space that you want as well. So I hope you find the conversation very helpful. So, Cash and Cushions, as you know, is already launched. The mini course is designed for someone who's thinking about entering the home staging industry or home stager who are new to the industry. It's a 90-page mini e-course and workbook that helps you to set up a solid foundation for starting a profitable home staging business. The bootcamp version will be launched in late November, beginning of September,、um, beginning of December. Why take you through every aspect of running a home staging business, and I'll share with you all my workflow, processes, systems, and scripts dealing with most issues you encounter in the home staging business. So that's it for today's intro, and let's start the show. Wasn't personal, and it wasn't as creative. I, I felt like I wasn't using all of my creative abilities, if you will. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I think that definitely makes sense.、Um, you know, I, I you felt do, like I was just packing. Yeah, you、mm-hmm. do have to be a bit more creative because you are working with someone else's stuff, and their stuff might not gel with your own personal style. But because With I think we occupy you really just have to embrace that project and then、we'll、go with it. Yeah, and that has its own challenges, but logistically, it's easier just to take what a homeowner has and work with that, and then maybe augment with the you know lamps and area rugs and that sort of thing, rather than 
to have to haul. I felt like I was just packing things up and installing and then repacking and putting away. So do you not bring any props in who are doing Occupy Homes? I don't. I give the sellers a list. And it's usually lamps, it's shower curtains, um, bath towels for the bathrooms. It's, it's usually small things, maybe a table runner, pillows for the sofas. Usually I'm always asking them to get a new comforter or quilt for their bed. So it's things like that that they can use in their new home. That's very cool. So you just basically, you go online and you research a list of props and then you have them buy it, basically. Yes, I tell them where the best places to shop and how high the lamp needs to be. And oftentimes, sellers need artwork too, especially above that mantle or on a large wall or above a bed. And I also recommend that they go to their friends and their neighbors and ask to borrow a few things. That has worked out really well. That's interesting. Do you ever get pushback from a seller for spending more money on the project? I haven't. Well, I haven't. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it depends. I can't say that I never get pushed back. That would be a lie. <laughs> uh, sometimes if they've got some remodeling to do, let's say they're taking down the 1980s wallpaper in the kitchen and they're installing tile where there was vinyl flooring before, you know, and they've, they're already putting an investment in painting the whole house. And I say, well, you need new bedding or you need, you know, a few things here and there. And sometimes, you know, I get the cross-eyed look and they're looking overwhelmed or saying, I've already maxed out my budget. And um, so we talk about what we can do. Okay. So maybe we only, we don't have $300 to spend on props. Maybe we only have a hundred dollars. Where can we use that money wisely? Yeah, I think that's really good because I think, um, I think you really have to prioritize like what's important and what is not. Um, so I think a lot of times homeowners get stuck on the little details because they're not sure in terms of what they need to do. Um, yeah. Yes. And you know, what's really interesting, Cindy, is that the clients who do spend the extra usually get that back and then some more. Interesting. Yeah. They're, they're concerned that they're not going to see a return on their investment. And they think like, oh, they're just flushing some more money down the toilet. Yeah. I happily, we're all happy that the, the return on investment is really, really good. That's great. That's really good news. I think that's, that's where sellers usually get stuck with the fear because they are afraid they're going to shell out more money and then they're not going to see that investment back. Exactly. So when you work with... Um, your clients, do your homeowner usually pay for Occupy staging or the sellers pay? I mean, sorry, the agent pay or the sellers pay? Most of the agents pay. I hardly have any sellers who pay for their own consultation. I've been working with a fantastic group of real estate agents for several years now, and they pay for my service to go out and meet with their seller. But then the seller doesn't really have any skin in the game. So then do you encounter issues with that? Like, so maybe sellers don't really want to do the staging, but the, the realtor pay for it anyway. And so they're kind of refusing to let you do anything in the house. Have you ever encountered that? Is, yeah, that's, that's a fabulous question. You're right about the skin in the game. And my realtors have become very savvy over the years and they will ask some questions and kind of feel that seller out. And if the seller at the beat, you know, right up front says, I won't make any changes or yeah, I could meet with your stager, but I don't want to do anything. Then that realtor won't send me out. Yeah. This is a waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> right? And they tell me I'm not sending you out. I'm not going to pay for you just to go out. And that client says, eh, <laughs> that, what you say is nice, but I'm not doing it. But you know, that's few and far between. Yeah, you know, it's true because I have had situations like that where, I mean, the seller clearly is just not into it, but the realtor pay for it anyway. But I'm kind of like, you know, once I leave, they're going to just like redo everything and put it back the way it was, right? And I it's have... like, I'm going to try to make sure they do it, at least until the photographer comes. 
but I'm like, yes. But then fire's gonna show up, and it'd be like, this doesn't look like the photos. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, those sellers realize it sometimes. They'll, you know, a little too late, or you know, after the home's been on the market and they're stressed out and they're making those mortgage payments, which is unfortunate. But they do finally learn the hard way that they should have listened or they shouldn't have changed things. I did have one time, one time where I went in, moved things around with the help of the real estate agent, got everything in place. It looked fabulous. And then they waited a little while to put the house on the market. When I looked at the photos online, they had put every single thing back where they had it originally. And you know, that home sat on the market. <laughs> That's really a shame. Not to, when, not to mention a waste of money. It's so sad. Because mm -hmm. I think usually when realtor pay for it out of pocket, they get reimbursed by the seller. So the seller basically just wasted all that money. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a bummer. I, I hate yes. I hate hearing stories like that. I'm like, no, they wasted their money. Right, but it really doesn't happen very often. That's because like I said, nowadays, in the last couple of years, I go to meet with the sellers and I ask them, have you worked with a stager before? Are you familiar with home staging? And they say, oh, yeah. And you know what? You're not going to hurt my feelings if, if you tell me to move things or pack things. Please tell me because I really want to sell this house. Yeah, so I agree with you. So we heard what, uh, what you like most about the Occupy staging projects. But is there mm -hmm. anything that you find challenging when it comes to doing Occupy's? Of course. <laughs> I think the most, the most challenging situation is when a seller has very little to work with. Yeah. Or what they have is very dated. And so we end up editing. I like to call it editing or removing many of the things in the house just to keep it very, very simple. But it, it is very challenging when you don't have much to work with. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, especially, I find out especially like um, couples who are young who just got married and um, it's their first home. And for some reason, they don't buy any artwork. They're afraid to like touch the walls. Almost. Yes. So you yes. walk in, there's like no decoration whatsoever. Um, then that's usually when we bring stuff in, actually. Um, because you do need, I think you do need some sort of lifestyle element to kind of warm up the space. You definitely do. It's so important. It really is important to liven up and warm up yeah. each space in the home, at least the, you know, the most important ones. Um, so I either recommend purchasing or, or borrowing, you know, if it's short term, you can borrow neighbors. And I even have some sellers who will tell me, oh, my neighbor said I could borrow anything from her that I needed. I'll borrow her dining set or a sectional or a sofa or whatnot. So it's a, a great way to do it. Yeah, I think so. I and then, um, so, so we talk about, because with occupies, the sellers actually live in the house. So how do you set the right expectations for them to be able to maintain the staging while they're living in the house? Yes, good question. And that can be challenging for the sellers who have kids or pets or both. And I can see them becoming overwhelmed, you know, with all of the details, you know, hide the trash cans and put away the paper towels. So what I tell them is I said, for your photographs, make your house look like you don't live in it, like a model home. So like I said, the paper towels, the toilet bowl scrubber, the toothbrushes, the shampoos, all of those things that we use on a daily basis, hide those for your photos because we can do anything for a day, right? Yeah. Uh, we can get it picture perfect as I call it. And then I tell them afterward, if you leave a toothbrush out, I mean, nobody wants to see your toothbrush, but people know you're living in the home and it's not going to be a deal breaker. You know, if, if, like I said, if the toothbrush is out or if the paper towels are out, but for photographs, that's the very first impression. That's what everybody sees when they're shopping for their home and all those things like trash cans or even those little scented plugins and cords from lamps, all those things seem to just stand out so much more. And when you're in the home, 
you're taking so much in that some of those little things don't stand out as much. So I do suggest that they carve out a little place in the pantry or a kitchen cabinet and then a bathroom cabinet where they can take a little plastic container and kind of stash all those daily use items and hide them for their showings or for their photographs to make it a little easier. And then, of course, packing. The more stuff you pack, the less stuff you have to manage when you're living in your house. So, so that always helps. If there's less to maintain, um, that means less stress. I agree with that. Um, but sometimes I do find my seller sometimes overpack. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because when I, get there, I yes, think the challenge, taking. yeah, I think the challenge with occupied and also I've noticed that when I was doing uh, consultations where I give sellers instruction how to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And then when I come back, I realize they overpacked and then there's like nothing on the counter at all. It's like a very minimalistic look which works great if you live in Scandinavia, but not so much <laughs> if you're in like America. So, yes. so yeah. So how do you work with seller to kind of, you know, toe the line, so to speak, like to make sure they have just enough the right stuff. That's tricky because a lot of them will say, Oh, I wanted to, I, my real estate agent told me I needed to pack some stuff up. So I packed all the cookbooks and I packed all the platters and, all of the decorative things and it's all in storage and I don't know where it is. Mm. So we work with what they have again, borrowing shopping for a few things. Sometimes they've got a bowl and we can put fruit in a bowl. Yeah. I mean, we just do whatever we can. We get really creative. That's very awesome. And um, what are some of the common mistakes that you see homeowners make and what should they do instead? One of the common mistakes is lining up the furniture in their family room or living room and it faces the TV, kind of like a movie theater. You've probably yeah. seen that. Mm -hmm. I call it the bowling alley, you know. It's the new low, it's a new focal point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just saw it the other day again. Um, we've got a big sofa and two big recliners and they're all just right in a row facing the TV. And, you know, that's perfect when you're watching the Olympics or a football game or mm -hmm. HGTV, you know, your favorite show. But when people are coming into your home, they want to see that conversation grouping. So that's something that I find that I'm talking about a lot with sellers. We need a conversation group and we can't have all the furniture just in a row. I like that saying a lot, the conversation grouping, because I think with staging, you're showing the potential of the home. And mm -hmm. so um, you kind of want to stage it as if you are having friends over, um, mm -hmm. new friends over who's never seen your house before. And so conversation grouping is very important, whereas it's not so much like where you're showcasing your television as the focal point, because you're really showcasing your home. And that's why when you look at interior magazine, they always do the conversation grouping. You very, very rare, rarely see like a television, like front and center as the focal point of the photo. So, exactly. Yeah. Never. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really good tip. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so now you do a lot of interior design or mostly interior design, correct? Yes. And so yeah. at what point do you decide to transition over to the interior design side of business? I had been staging for about, let's see, five years maybe, you know, part-time in the beginning before it led to full-time because I had the little kids. Mm -hmm. And I just had my previous clients, previous sellers and friends say, hey, I need some help with some design work now. I need to remodel the space or I need flooring or I need paint colors and I'm not moving and it grew from there and I wasn't sure I could do it to be honest with you I thought I don't know if I can do this there's so much to learn and I'm still learning of course we all are and and things change trends change design styles change quickly in this industry so keeping up with with that is a lot but there's a lot to know 
about remodeling and, and where do we use an air gap or how far should the air gap be from the faucet because we're drilling holes in the countertop and you can only get it right once, right? Yeah. So um, it was intimidating, but I had a mentor that I worked with and I still work with who showed me the ropes. And my first project was an entire home. And we did, we replaced some countertops in the bathrooms. We did custom drapes. We did custom window blinds and window coverings, all the furniture, rugs, lighting. And it was a blast. That's so personal. really cool. Mm-hmm. And then do you find that, um, do you find it difficult to juggle motherhood when you're um, working as a home stager? I absolutely do. <laughs> I want to be a good stager. I want to be a good designer. I want to be a good mom and a good wife. And it is, it's a challenge to balance all of those roles. You know, you only have so much time in the day, but I find that some days I'm very focused on my work. And then other days I get to focus more on the family. And then once in a while I get to focus on some me time. So you know, there's not a set schedule. It's really hard to set that, you know, an exact schedule. And I don't like to live by exact schedules anyway. That's just not me and how I like to live and how I like to work. But it also seems to work out. So I know a lot of, um, I think a lot of people get confused between interior design and home staging. So can you talk about a little bit about the difference between the two? I would love to. The biggest difference is the personalization. When you're selling a home, you want to remove your imprint from it. So your diplomas, your wedding photos, your favorite teams, all of that needs to go away. And what you're doing is you're, you're marketing your home for that potential buyer. So when we market something, we're tailoring it and we're gearing it toward that buyer and we want it to be less personal when we're designing when I'm designing for somebody it's very personal and I think that's why I like design so much is that I get to work long term with a client to create something that's so personal so that when they come home when they wake up in their space they feel so comfortable and so peaceful and so happy. Yeah, that's, mm. I think that's really important. I think your home really needs to like make you happy and make you feel productive and inspired. Yes. Um, because you spend so much time in your own home. Yes. Like even so some, much. yeah. Yeah. Even if you travel, you, you know, you always come back to home and you want to come back to something that is you, a reflection yeah. of you that meets all of your needs. And so we kind of stripped that away. You know, we talked about all the furniture in a line uh, in the family room right in front of the TV. You know, some of us live that way with all the furniture in the line, and that's perfectly fine. Um, But when staging, we're changing things around. We're making it for the buyer. We're marketing. We have that mindset. What does the potential buyer want to see? How do they want to feel when they walk into this space? Yeah, I think that's really important. And then um, I was just thinking, um, when you watch movies, oftentimes their home environment kind of reflect the life that they're living at the time. Mm-hmm. So this mm-hmm. probably date me a little bit, but I remember watching Fight Club in college. And then in the beginning, I think Edward Norton's character was very materialistic driven. So like when they show his apartment, they did this like panning shot where, like, everything was, like, from Ikea. It was basically the Ikea catalog home. (laughs) And Uh um, they did all these pop-up, you know, this is, like, the the Billy bookcase or whatever. Um, But (laughs) that was, like, in the 90s where Ikea is, like, this trendy thing where, like, everybody has to buy Ikea. Uh Um, Or that Bradley Cooper movie, like, what is it? Uh, They turned that into a TV show. Limitless. Uh-huh. Um, like in the beginning where he was just like this like hobo guy who like doesn't really have a real job and like 
It's like terrible life living. His girlfriend's dumping him. It's like there's no prospect in his life. And he's been writing the same and book for like. And he's hopeless, and his home reflects that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and his home totally reflected that until like mm -hmm. he like turned his life around and it looked completely different. Yeah. So yeah, so I think that's really fascinating. You you touched on something so great there, Cindy, about how our home reflects our current lifestyle, our current mindset or our current challenges maybe even and if we want to aspire for greater or for more or for change then our environment needs to reflect that I think that's one of the other things I love about design so much is that we can change your attitude we can even boost your outlook by changing your environment yeah, and I really agree with that as well. There's so much people can do, like even just so little, like the little things. Um, even if you just like clear up your desk area and then like mm -hmm. clear out all the clutter, you're going to feel so much more productive. Yes, exactly. Um, so when you say that you have a full service interior design company, so what does that entail when you say full service? That means, in a nutshell, that my client only has to tell me what they like and what they don't like, and I will take care of everything else. Doesn't that sound great? That sounds fantastic. <laughs> Doesn't that sound easy? And yeah. I tell them, all you have to do is tell me what you like and what you don't like. Of course, write a check, and then I'll take care of the rest. I'll handle the returns, the orders, uh, damaged items back ordered items, selecting everything to make sure everything looks perfect together and flows from room to room, the installation, um, all of that. I make sure it all gets taken care of so you, my client can just continue to work or vacation or do whatever they need to do. That's very cool. Because usually, how long does your interior design projects normally go for? Like, hmm, that's a good question. Let's see. They months, all kind of or even years, probably not years, but I, I've mm -hmm. known well, people do projects. Project, it took about eight months, nine yeah. months, and I, and I equ equated that to, you know, being pregnant and giving birth to a baby because, mm -hmm. you know, a project becomes so personal and your clients become so um, close that, you know, it's kind of like birthing your baby. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, some, I don't think I've had any project take more than a year. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. And then um, in your bio, you described your style as imaginative, happy, and charming. So how did you come about discovering your own style? I worked with a writer who writes for designers. And I spoke with her and said, you know, I need to work on this branding. I'm, I feel like I'm having a hard time being objective about what my brand is and about what I'm all about. And I said, definitely happy is part of it. I want my clients to feel happy when they're working with me. I want them to feel happy when they're in their space. Um, so happy was big, right? We all want to feel happy, at least some of the time. <laughs> we can't feel happy all the time, but at least some of the time. Mm -hmm. And then we came up with imaginative because I like to take things that um, I guess repurpose things. Uh, for example, in my home office, I have a dresser, which happens to be from Ikea, <laughs> <laughs> that I've had for many years. And I painted it. I filled in the holes where the hardware was. I installed new hardware. I think the hardware costs more than the actual dresser now. <laughs> I know it's a credenza in my office and it holds my um, fabric samples and office supplies and all that good stuff. So I think that imagination of taking something that was meant for one purpose and using it for another is very, very fun and very, very personal. And then, yeah. of, and then of course, the charming part. I like to take items that have history, like milk glass. Items that can be found in consignment stores or flea market or a thrift store like crystal vases and milk glass bowls and silver trays 
and things like that. Just incorporating a few pieces like that or even the client's collections from traveling or things that have been handed down to them from their relatives, you know, infusing those pieces or pieces that are just unexpected or even an unexpected color on a ceiling or an unexpected and fun, charming color palette. I find all those things to be charming. That's very cool. Um, yeah, I think like going back to your Ikea hack, I think, I think people kind of in a way look down to Ikea, but I think it's actually, they have some really nice and like chic pieces um, that don't look like the typical Ikea kind of stuff. I actually quite like their little accessories and little vases. I actually buy a lot of those for my fillers. Mm -hmm. um, they work quite well, actually. Yes, when used appropriately and used creatively, um, Ikea, you can get some great stuff and make it look awesome. I even did an Ikea dresser for a client for the baby nursery and we cut the legs. Well, I say we, I like to say we, like I had some part of cutting this. I had part in the design plan, but not in the actual cutting of the legs or the painting of the piece. But I gave instructions, cut the legs like this, paint it this, this color. And then we bought some overlays, these little pieces that were already pre-cut. And I actually, I did do this part, I glued them to the face of the dresser drawers. So it's a custom piece and it's very charming and imaginative and happy, but on a budget. Yeah. So I like did, that. Did the client complain that it was from Ikea? No. Awesome. <laughs> we had discussed that. No, we had discussed that ahead of time. And she gave me a budget, you know, like all clients do. Here's here's the budget. And I say, okay, well, I'm going to have to be real creative and we'll have to do something repurposed or something from Ikea that we can dress up and hack. Um, so, yeah. I think that's good. I think, I think that's very successful because you had set up the expectations with the clients. Otherwise, they might like, they're like, why did I just pay you? to get, get a dresser from Ikea. <laughs> like, you know, I think it's important to set that expectations because I think a lot of times people do feel like, well, we're hiring a stager, so why are we spending all this money for if he's going to move stuff around? But there's actually much more into it, like what we do. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of psychology behind it, definitely. And so how do you work with clients to come up with a scheme that they're happy with? Lots of time spent together in consultations and conversation. And then they share their house photos or their Pinterest photos with me of rooms that inspire them and rooms that they like. And we talk about, okay, what do you like about the room? What, you, what don't you like about the room? And what they don't like is just as important as what they do like. That tells me a lot about them. And of course, I, I do ask a lot of questions about how they live and how they want the rooms to function. I love rooms that are functional. I, I'm not a big fan of museum rooms or showrooms um, for clients. And then after we have conversations and after they've shown me some photos, I start selecting items and I have an app where I can do that very easily and then they can vote. I might show them three sofas. You know, what do you think about these sofas? And they'll make comments and they can vote, yep, love it, nope, hate it, thumbs down. And that works out very well. So once I get even, you know, I hone in even further on what they like and what they don't like, then I'm able to come up with a really wonderful design plan that they love. That's very cool. So how do you select the colors for the home? Well, we always talk about colors at the beginning, what they like and what they don't like. And then I might make some suggestions, you know, how about, you know, this color for your wall and this color for the sofa and maybe, you know, drapes and pillows could be this color. And it's very loose at the beginning. Of course, we have a direction of maybe the color scheme, but where exactly we're putting those colors is very loose in the beginning. And then I always like to start with the biggest piece of furniture in the room. And this is assuming the client has nothing new that they're bringing to the room, nothing that we're working with. So in the bedroom, it would be the bed, in the living room, the sofa, and in the office, it would be the desk. 
So we start out with the biggest piece, the most expensive item, if you will, and then work from there with all of the coordinating items. And then the color just grows from there. And we might start with a fabric for the drapes. We always do custom drapes and that will lead to the rug or vice versa. So it just depends on what's inspiring me based on all the input from the clients. That's very cool. And how does that process differ from staging a home? Like when you're picking colors to sell? Yes. When we're picking colors to sell, I'm picking colors that are always on the lighter side of things. We want a light and bright home when we're selling. We don't want to get very personal with color. So I'll pick neutrals. And neutral could be lighter greens and lighter blues, grays, beiges, um, colors in those families. Um, Sometimes we go a little darker just depending on the house and depending on the neighborhood and the potential buyer. But we do like to keep things usually lighter and more neutral on the walls when we're selling. I do like to inject color, though. That really makes a space more exciting. And color varies. I know 80% of the population, both men and women, like blue. So blue is always a good bet if you're wondering what color to bring in. But orange, and yellow, green, those all work really well with blue or on their own a little yeah. bit. I, I do. Yeah, I do agree with that. I do pops of color. My, my personal, like my, when I do my staging, the, the bigger pieces are usually more neutral colors. Mm-hmm. And I do the pops of color like oranges and reds um, or yellow, actually, depending on the season. In my like accessories or lamps, you know, those are really good places to add in like pops of color, artwork, throw pillows, um, throws, that kind of stuff. Because then it makes the space look more visually interesting as well. Yeah. And even if that buyer maybe doesn't particularly care for orange or yellow, just seeing it in a home in, in little amounts, not in the finishes of the home, but in the accessories can be wonderful. And they can really enjoy that or see a new perspective and a new palette that they wouldn't have otherwise imagined or maybe even thought that they would like. But I also love what you say about the seasons because it's so true when we're picking colors. I do pick brighter, lighter colors for spring and summer and then richer, warmer colors for fall and winter. Yeah. And um, I, I like before we did this show, I asked in our Facebook group what kind of questions like people have. Mm-hmm. And one of the most often asked questions is usually like, what color should I repaint my home? Um, I usually are very hesitant to get people specific colors because depending on where you are, the lighting, the way sun hits the color, it's going to look really different. Like I live in California or I used to live in California in San Francisco. That's Northern California versus like LA and, you know, Southern mm-hmm. California. The light itself is very different. Um, so the colors that work in San Francisco might not really work in LA. So that's why it's sometimes it can be tricky on the show like this where people are like, what color should I paint my house? <laughs> You're like, right. I don't know because I need, I really need to be there and kind of see how the light affects the colors. But it's also kind of interesting to ask everybody like, well, what is your color selection process like? Right. There, you're right. There's so many factors. The lighting from my house to the neighbor's house next door, the colors will look different depending on their flooring, depending on their cabinets, their furnishings. Yeah. And then how about finish selections? Um, I got this question in the group as well. And for example, um, this listener that we have, she is in the process of selling her house. And um, she's wondering, well, for plumbing fixture, should they all match together? Um, and then what kind of finishes should they choose? Um, and actually, she asked this really fantastic question about rehab. It's like, is your budget should be put into, um, let me look at their wording. Like, is it better to put your rehab budget or fixing and improving things that buyers will really look? Attractive to the buyers or something not visually interesting like adding insulation or updating your HVAC system to a more energy efficient one? Like what's your opinion on that one? 
Wow. That's a big question. <laughs> That's a huge question. <laughs> and, and it may be geared more for one of my real estate agents. Uh, I do think the HVAC is really important, but emotions sell. Yeah. And especially for the women who are, you know, helping to make the decision on a purchase, walking into that home and seeing those beautiful finishes and fixtures, that's going to go a long way. But gosh, yeah. that's tough. It is tough. That's both. Can we say both? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think that if you have limited budget, if your HVAC is, is dying, like you should definitely replace HVAC. Yeah, anything um, that's broken needs to be fixed, definitely. But if it's just updating, I think that's kind of a lower priority. Um, because that's something that the buyers may, they may or may not care, actually. Does nobody really go through the house and think about, well, oh, what's going to happen with my HVAC system? People yeah. go through the house when they think, how can my family live here? And so I think a lot of times design decision in a way may trump practical decision unless a practical decision is something like oh my foundation is bad then you need definitely mm, need to fix definitely. that mm -hmm. um, or my ceiling is cracked or there's cracks mm -hmm. on my wall you definitely need to fix those things that's going to really break your deal but a hvac system is really not going to break the deal then the aesthetics decision might become more important in that instance I agree with you 100%. Don't fix it if it's not broke. Yeah. And then for the finishes, um, so this is her question. If you're going to replace a dated color plumbing fixture, do all the plumbing fixtures need to match? Or is it okay or even preferable if the updated ones are white? I think this is very specific. But um, oh, this would be for a kitchen then because you said white. So I was thinking yeah. plumbing as in faucets for a bathroom. But... Yeah, but it's a Chain really good appliances. question as well. Yeah, if you just mm -hmm. fix one, should I? If you just replace one, let's say you have one that's like from the seventies, or you like you know your house was built in seventies, so you have all these plumbing fixtures or faucets all you know in the seventies. Mm, they style. all need to match. Yeah, so then if you change one, it's gonna look a little bit strange. Yeah, <laughs> one thing leads to another. I like that story. If you give a mouse a cookie. You know, if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want a glass of milk. So if you replace your dishwasher with the stainless steel one and your microwave is white, mm, we've got some, dis you know, it's disjointed. It's off balance. So preferably they should all match. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that also those type of decisions also come with the way you budget as well. Um, this is why I'm a big fan of just writing everything down, like a massive checklist to have. Mm -hmm. So just kind of you can prioritize between the projects that you need to update or you definitely need to update kind of things. You're right. It's all about priorities and where you can get the most bang for your buck. And I always like to tell people if they think that they're going to be selling within a year or two, don't wait till the last minute. Start making changes, making upgrades and updates now. Enjoy it, first of all, and then you reduce your stress, you know, of having people coming in your home and making those purchases and just financially, if you can start now, it'll be better. So what are some of the design principles that are really important in your design? First of all, the house needs to reflect the client and it needs to function and support my clients in the way that they want to live. And second of all, um, there are certain things that will make that house, I guess, more comfortable, you know, when we're talking about budget and, and how can we take that budget and how can we stretch that budget and we're, should we allocate the dollars? If we're furnishing the living room, for example, I always like to say, let's spend the most amount of money we can on the upholstered pieces. You'll be sitting in those pieces on a regular basis, daily possibly, um, rather than your case goods. And your case goods are your wood pieces, metal pieces, your coffee tables, side tables, console tables. So that's um, a big principle there. And then color color 
can affect your mood. Color can support, like we talked earlier, inspiration, aspirations. So we need to use color effectively wherever we can, whether on the walls, the rugs, the drapes, the artwork. That's something that's really important to me and really has a big impact. And then, of course, scale and balance, as every designer knows. Um, this proper scale and balance of the furniture and the placement, the room flow, and then texture. Texture is really important. We don't want to have a room that's got all kinds of sparkle and shine and then where it's all just so shiny and reflective, we've got to mix in some flat and matte and other textures and it's got to be a really great balance. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. I really love That's really, really great. And I really love that you mentioned texture. And I think texture is really often overlooked, but it really <laughs> adds depth into mm -hmm. a scene. It's like the umami flavor people talk about. It just, it really kind of make your photos look more layered, more mm -hmm. like more in, like there's more things to look at basically. Yes. Keeps it more interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important because I think that's something that's, that can be like, it also can trip up people because people are like, oh my God, texture, what is it? Like, it's, it's not something, but yeah, it's like you said, you know, there's shiny and there's matte, you know, there's smooth. I mean, mm -hmm. or like a throw. Hard you know? and soft. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's all texture. And that's what are really, when we talk about staging, it's really about appealing to the five senses. And I think touch mm -hmm. is something that people often ignored. And I remember when I first, because before I was a stager, I was a buyer's agent. And I remember the trainer was like, this particular, this broker of our, our office, and he owned like, he owned five brokerages at a time in our area. So he was doing quite well. But he was saying that one of the most important thing as a buyer's agent is you want to observe your buyers when they're walking through a home. Because if they keep touching things, like, if they're like in the kitchen, they're touching the countertop, they're like feeling the cabinet doors and all that stuff, that's usually a good sign that they really like the house. Yes. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting because I think one of the things with seasoned realtor too is like they really understand reading their bot like their buyer's body language to see to gauge kind of their like interests, even if they don't mm -hmm. say anything. Same thing obviously with seller's agent. And that's mm -hmm. usually what the season agents in our office would say. It's like, if you know they want to buy the house, they would be touching everything. Exactly. So important. Yeah. And then um, what do you think about photography? How important is it in your line work? It is of utmost importance, whether you're selling or for me as a designer from our portfolio, um, I get a lot of referrals from friends and previous clients. And of course, the first thing they want to look at are the photos. They want to see my work. What can I do? What's my style? Does it mesh with theirs? And professional and good quality photographs make a huge difference. Yeah, we try to draw it up in like pretty much every episode. <laughs> <laughs> Especially now I work as a photographer. I mean, it's so important. I mean, there's all these things. It's kind of interesting to go into photography after having the 10 years, you know, of working in interiors. Because you really notice the difference. Like when people really work in all the design principles, you know, like we just talk about balance and scale. I mean, all these are really important things in photography. And especially you're learning about how people kind of like the brain, the way the like, you know, what we like and we don't like. Sometimes mm -hmm. when you see something, you're like, I don't like it, but you can't pinpoint why. It's just the sort like the way our brain works. So yes. it's really actually fascinating to study photography because you definitely learn a lot about how how you can manipulate lighting and all this mood and it's kind of fascinating actually. It's very geeky. It is. Which is probably it's a I science like it. and it's an art which is really, really fascinating, I think. And what I've started to do is rather than just let my photographer shoot a room, she will have an iPad or let me look through her viewfinder. 
Yeah. Because the way she sees a room is different than the way I see the room. She's seeing my photographer will come in, see the room for the first time, right? I've been intimately involved. I have a relationship with the room, the way I've been creating it and putting it together and layering it. That's another principle, layers, right? Texture and layers. And I see it or and I want it to be shown in a way that I guess reflects my style, my brand, maybe all of the above. And I might see that space or that shot, that lineup differently than the photographer does. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, for sure. And it's funny because I talk to more and more photographers now and a lot of them actually feel, I don't want to say annoyed, or scared, but a lot of them actually don't know how to style. <laughs> so they feel very awkward mm-hmm. because they feel like they take the photo, they can sense that something isn't quite right, but they don't know how to tweak it. So I think it's really important. It's actually a really nice advantage when stagers are there with the photographer because not every photographer know how to tweak things. Yes. Because a lot that's of photographers that. too, that's the thing is like, all they really know, especially with real estate photographers, because you're not paying them a whole lot. You're, it's not like Pari Barn where you're, you know, paying photographer a five figure thing to like come mm-hmm. out to California from New York to shoot a campaign for, you know, William Sonoma kind of thing. You, you're pay like most for real estate photography is about two hundred and fifty dollars or you know, one hundred and fifty high end, maybe five six hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. And you had to do post production on your photos. You had to select the best ones, and then you had to do post production on them. So it's actually a lengthy process. Um, mm-hmm. So most real estate photographer, they just really they plug in the computer. They have this like preset we call in the computer program, and they click it, and that's all they really do. And they maybe tweak minor things because the more time they spend on it, obviously the the less money they will make. So. That's that's the tricky thing. A lot of people just really go in, take the photograph, and that's it. They, they're not necessarily going to tweak it to make the photo mm-hmm. look better. So it's actually really, really important. Like, you know, if you're a stager listening to this and you are working on building a portfolio, you should consider being there when the photographer is taking the shot, especially early on. And mm-hmm. I think that's great that your photographer lets you to see it on the iPad immediately. So I think that's one of the things that's really important when I learned on working on photo shoot is that the way camera sees things are different than the way our eyes see things. Yes. Um, especially when it comes to lighting as well. Our eyes are yes. actually amazing because we can adapt to any kind of lighting situation. Mm-hmm. So you walk into a really dark room and then your eyes will adapt to the dark room, you know, within five, 10 seconds, but a camera, cannot do that it's the artificial eye basically Mm -hmm. so it's really important for you to actually see the image um and then kind of figure out the spacing as well because just the way the camera sometimes camera distorts the image as well so it's really it's like really it's really actually really fascinating very geeky so i'm like geeking out over (laughs) that's okay go right ahead but yeah, I think that's one of the more but you're right. Things I learned. There's so much to it. It's very involved. It's very complex. And when done right, brilliant. Right? Yeah. When you're selling a home, um, the first impression is no longer at the curb like it used to be before we had the internet. Now it's a photo online. So it's so important. And for yeah. designers, you know, it, our work, it's that first impression. It's so important. It is. And I actually read a stat today. Over 70% of people now buy furniture online, which is crazy to me. Because like if you're buying a sofa, (laughs) you're always like, I want to feel how it sits, you know, like if I can lie in it kind of thing. But most people just like order on the internet. Same thing with mattress, which is like crazy to me too, because like you spend so much time on your mattress, probably eight hours, six to eight hours a day. So yeah, but that's the trend today. So it's like super important to have really great photos. Mm-hmm. So I just have a couple questions left. Um, okay. If the seller has very little budget, but they want to update their home to live or to sell, what would you recommend? And where to start with that budget? And they want an update? Yeah. Are we talking remodel or, or furnishing just aesthetically? 
Um, I think in this case, probably aesthetically. Usually, if they have limited budget, it's probably not like I think remodeling usually costs at least five figure. Yeah. Um, you can update countertops and backsplash for oh, a few thousand. True. Yeah. You but know. let's say let's say let's say this is a, you're talking in a weekend. No, they want well, to update updates in a weekend, like a weekend styling kind of a thing. Well, do you want to talk about different time frame? Actually, that would be really exciting. I just realized how vague this question is, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, where are we going with that? Yes, but yeah, let's let's drill into that if you have time. Yeah, sure, sure. That's this is great. So if they've got a weekend and let's say a thousand dollars or less. Quick changes, my, my very one, number one go-to is always going to be paint. Mm -hmm. Paint covers a multitude of sins, paint updates, paint can add charm and character. Um, let's say you're going into a dining room and you want an update for your dining room. You could obviously paint the walls and I know everybody says that, just paint the walls. But what about painting the ceiling? Put a dramatic color on the ceiling and change the entire room. Very little paint, very little time, very little effort, unless you're painting my ceiling and it was four coats of paint, but I won't go into that. Um, but very quick and very easy. Or painting out a piece of furniture or painting out your dining table, for example. Yes, there's some sweat equity involved, but you could totally do that in a weekend for a hundred bucks or less. New look repurposing and very exciting because who has a cool color dining table mm -hmm. you could <laughs> so paint paint is oh my god if you don't like the color of it just paint it i've got this great big huge mirror it had this shiny brass gold frame on it and i you know it was dated but it was a really good big beveled mirror and so i cannot tell you how many times i've painted that frame and given it a new lease on life so paint frames Furniture, walls, ceiling, doors. What about painting your interior doors at a pretty charcoal or black color? Or even a fun turquoise color, if that goes with your color scheme. Very quick and easy and done in a weekend. And of course, you know, you can go shopping at Home Goods and pick up pillows and throws and accessories very quickly and very easily. And there's not a whole lot of elbow grease involved with those updates. And then if we want to go a little further, you've got a little more budget, 5,000-ish range. Depending on the kitchen, you can get a level one, level two granite and a gorgeous backsplash. Bada boom, bada bing. That's awesome. What's the difference between level one and level two? Uh, You're limited with the level one. You get, definitely get a lot more flakes, a lot more spots. It's very dense the pattern uh, and when you go up with the levels you get more striation more graining so to speak more movement that's very okay. cool yeah yeah so yeah you know so. these things it's so magical <laughs> <laughs> oh and then remnants you know you can go and get oh, yeah. remnants marble and granite for your island your island doesn't have to match your perimeter cabinets or just paint the island a great fun color Do, can you tell that i love paint <laughs> no paint is great when i used to freelance for anthropology for display we painted everything like even like fabrics you know to make it look completely different it's amazing like it's really the cheapest thing you can ever buy to like create a whole new different look for your home yes i love it that's awesome <laughs> um i love it and i love you brought up remnants actually because um actually a client of mine she was just very, very good at like bargain shopping. And she once drove like three hours to get mm. this giant piece of marble. It's like white Carrera marble somebody didn't want for like $20 for this giant slab of it. And then she basically got, got it home somehow by herself with a truck. I don't know how she did it, but she got a counter. She got two countertops and three bathroom sink like countertop which was amazing because we're talking about like kitchen wow. island like you know the regular kitchen uh -huh. and then um three like three bathrooms so it was amazing and she just like really know how to like cut it up to the point like where she wanted it 
Beautiful. Love it. She was like, $20. I was like, oh my gosh. Score. I what know, a that was such a beautiful house. Oh my gosh. Um, and what, one more tip too I'd like to share. If you want to update, upgrade, change out something in your home, lighting. I think so mm-hmm. many homeowners and sellers neglect the lighting. It's not always, you know, I'm talking about your ceiling light fixtures, not just your lamps and things at eye level, but we forget, you know, if we've got ceiling fans that the builder has installed and you just lived with them over their years, or maybe you've replaced it with a bigger or different ceiling fan. I'm here in Texas and I know it's hot as Hades, but remove the ceiling fan and replace it with a gorgeous light fixture. And it doesn't have to be shiny and sparkly crystal, whatever your style is. It could be an orb, um, it could be black, it could be brown, it could be whitewashed, wood, whatever. A big, gorgeous light fixture. And you can go to Lamps Plus, their open box sale, and find amazing deals, half price, these really expensive light fixtures. And it will dramatically change the look and feel of your room. That's amazing. Um, in your experience, why don't stage homes sell? In my experience, it's usually because of two things. One, that it's overpriced, or one, it's just in the worst location. Maybe there's power lines in the backyard. It backs up to a freeway. Um, those are the two big reasons. Or if the finishes are just so outdated and everybody else in the neighborhood has updated and upgraded their finishes. Or the house smells really bad. <gasps> oh my gosh, you're right. Yes. If it smells really bad, yep, put that on the list. Yeah, that I've noticed that <laughs> people <laughs> uh, usually it's because someone either smokes or the pets, um, unfortunately. But I tell them, I'm not afraid to tell the seller your home smells like the dog had some accidents. And usually I, I can pinpoint where. Sometimes it's drapes. You know, a cat has a favorite spot on the drapes or it's a room and it's a carpet or it's an area rug. Sometimes it can be, the problem can be solved very easily. But if somebody's been smoking in the house, that's, that's a little more challenging. But I do tell them, you know, they're going to have to remedy the situation. That's awesome. And then my last question for you is, what is the one tip you'll give to a homeowner who are, who is thinking about putting their home on the market? Well, number one tip is to start packing. But like we said earlier, don't pack all the pretty things yet. Yes, don't <laughs> pack everything. Those. Or the leave closet. the box open for the stager if you're working <laughs> yeah, with one. There you go. That's a great idea, Cindy. Um, packing up your out-of-season clothing. Packing up the stuff in the garage. Getting rid of things. Donating. This is the perfect time to start getting rid of things that don't serve you, that you don't use, that you're not taking with you to your new home, that someone else could benefit from. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show today. You were amazing. You're just like a wealth of knowledge. Oh, thank you, Cindy. I have enjoyed my time with you today. Yeah, and I love your so bubbly. I'm always sounding a bit rough. So that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't left a review on iTunes, I really need you to do that right now. I've been having the most difficult time to book guests. And frankly, it's, I'm really sick and tired of chasing people down for interviews. It's a really exhausting process. I have to keep following up with them. And it really cuts down the fun on producing a podcast. Because my current traveling schedule, it just makes it very difficult when I can't pin people down to make to commit and to make the appointment, Um, especially since I live in London at the moment, it's really difficult to make sure the time overlaps with the time in the States. Um, And because I'm traveling so much, there's limited time I can only record shows. Um, I understand because the summer and fall market, things are really crazy for top producers. Um, And that's why it's been difficult to get people to commit to the show. But something like a lot of reviews and a lot of positive rating is going to really be something that pushes people to commit to be on the show. So if I can't book any guests for season five, there's not going to be a season five, unfortunately. So if you haven't left a review on iTunes, please do that right now. As usual, feel free to ask any questions on the show notes or in our private Facebook group. 
You can find our show notes by going to www.stagefromer.com slash podcast. That's it. Have a fantastic week and happy staging.